Um, what we're going to talk about now is this new uh, e-liquid, uh, the American e-liquid Manufacturing Standards Association. Mike's got a big smile on his face right now because he's primed for this one today. On our pre-show, we sure had some fun. So uh, let's just go through some basics here. Uh, we did contact AMSA and ask them to come on the show, um, and they've deferred us to sometime next week, so we'll be in touch with them and, and try to get a representative from their uh, organization on the show so that you guys who are vapors can call in and ask questions in mass and, and directly get your questions answered. Uh, I have the uh, website sort of programmed into our presentation here and if you take a look at it it's a fairly well designed website it looks as though it has uh, been touched by a professional uh, there's a couple of links that to me are fairly interesting uh, the first one is uh, meet the board and uh, the board is uh, the board is made up of the president uh, who is Lou Ritter the vice president, who is Scott Ely uh, from Vaporcast, the treasurer, which is Adam Knudsen from Vaporcast, the board secretary is Link Williams from We Are Vapors, the member advocate is James Beerup from Kalamazoo Vapor Shop. There's two positions here chair of standards committee and chair of compliance committee, which have not been filled yet, and Anthony Broncato from Juicy Vapor is a member. And uh, Kurt Kissler is the chemistry consultant. And you may remember Kurt from uh, the Box Elder incident. He was the uh, chemist who uh, tested the Box Elder e-liquid. Uh, the second thing uh, that I would, would want to show here tonight is the actual standards. And this is where Mike's going to be happy because he's been poring over this all day. And I can't wait to get into this with him. He, well, he not, wants to, not, he wants to, not all day, <laughs> not all day. Well, most, uh, some <laughs> of the day, uh, the standards are in PDF form on their website. Their website is www.aemca.org. I believe I will pull this back up and make sure that I have this correct. Yep. AEMCA.org. And these are the juice standards and they're, it's a fairly long read. It's fairly complicated. Uh, lots of rules, uh, standards in here, this type of thing. And I'm just going to throw this out to these guys and see where the heck this ends up at. Uh, whoever wants to pick it up, go for it. Basil? You, you were all over this. I'll let you begin, and I'll chime in and tell you why you're wrong. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. You go for it. Sure. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I had a limited amount of time, you know, because really we got the press release, what, uh, maybe two or three hours ago, right? So, and, you know, I had stuff to do before the show, but uh, I did get to look it over. I did get to, uh, you know, kind of uh, skim through it and uh, take a quick look at the site. And, you know, so, like, I mean, I do have, like, a couple questions, really like uh you know I, they lay out all of these things that they're going to do and all of these uh you know these are the standards but i want to know like how they're going to test who's going to test where the nicotine comes from you know i want to know uh who picked that gradient on the home page and why i want to know um <laughs> that was a joke <laughs> Not funny. i was thinking that was I, like overly thorough i you know I, I, I don't know. We could, we could go there. We can, if we I'm get them out here, we'll confront so. <laughs> them about the web design. You can, yeah, you but, you know, like, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, like, there was one specific line uh, where, you know, where it said, uh, you know, that there's a, a plus minus 5% tolerance. And I guess I kind of want clarification on that because, like, 5% of what? 5%. So, like, if it's, if it's a 12 milligram, um, you know, e-liquid, and then it's five, you know, five percent plus or minus of twelve milligrams. Uh, well, what about eighteen milligrams? What about uh, thirty-two milligrams? Twenty-four milligrams? Because five percent plus or minus 
of a higher milligram is is more of a tolerance for being in, incorrect, right? And and I know it's really like kind of, um, you know, it's not that much. You know, it's maybe from like 0.6 uh, milligrams to you know like maybe you know 1.6 milligrams, like being able to be off. Um, you know, wouldn't it make more sense to say you can only be off by you know 0.5 milligrams across the board so I'm and and like you know I guess the point is that I don't really you know these are just questions I have questions I'm allowed to have questions right uh, you know it's not opinions and and you know like I guess maybe they're well the gradient thing is an opinion but um, you know so I just I want more clarification I want to know when when does this happen right when when is this going to be uh you know set in the motion they they're talking about uh like real age verification i want to know how they're going to do that you know like how are you going to do are you going to do i have to uh, take a picture of my license and send it to you before i can buy stuff that's a barrier to entry are people going to do that do they want to do that um you know i don't want to do that so how's that going to work from a technology standpoint? Like I said, I design, I, you know, I'm a, a design director for an interactive firm and I, I want to know what the technology is behind verif verifying the age um, because I don't know of anything that can actually verify your age online. Well, there, there, there are a couple of embryonic services that do that. One of them, I believe, Basil is through Nexus, Lexus. Don't they do internet age verification? They may. I mean, they're they're the biggest competitor of my employer, so I, I'm not entirely positive. I know we don't have a competing yeah. service, but they get into some spaces that we're not in. Um, I, I right. know that they have a pretty sophisticated background search uh, process and provider yes. that, that that they provide as a service. Yes. Um, I, I guess it remains to be seen. I, the community reaction has been sort of what Mixed, you would, I would expect say, in a yeah. lot of ways what you would expect um, yeah <clears throat> next yeah you know i mean i think uh all all the questions that that sense has kind of raised are are pretty valid i think there's just a lot of things that everybody would like to know and uh i i don't see why getting those answered at some point is a bad problem or or a problem really for any group that's going to be considered reputable i think one of the biggest things that i worry about um knowing that you're talking about uh all of this, right? Um, in terms of you know, there's, there's very strict rules and guidelines for essentially what amounts to being more or less a laboratory in some ways, right? Or a mixed room, or a almost like a commercial kitchen. But the thing that I really wonder about is the bookkeeping and what some of these things might do from an expense standpoint to some of these businesses. Now, some of the vendors will have no problem jumping in. They're probably already complying with a good chunk of this. But what does that do from a cost perspective, right? We talked about a similar thing a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about the uh, the Omaha um, taxation bill, right? But having to keep records of this to be available to the board, um, I, I worry that this is going to potentially drive up operating costs in addition to a membership fee to basically put a stamp of approval. Now, it goes a long way, I think, to ensuring that the things that we are vaping are safe, and, and I'm not trying to discount uh, or discredit this at all. I just worry for vendors the the hassle that m may come out of kind of the stamp of approval, if you will. Well, I mean, if you're going to get a stamp of approval, it's going to cost money, right? And eventually, you know, we do have to uh, figure out a way to make sure that our e-liquid has a certain standard, and that's going to come at, at a cost no matter what. Right, so we can't just have people willy nilly selling e liquid. So I do understand where they're coming we, from with but that. But we, we do have people doing it. Well, I know, I know we do. And in the future, that's not going to exist, right? You're not going to have people in, in their basement making e liquid. It's just, I mean, unless it's like black market. But uh, I guess my feeling is that it's not fully baked, it's just a press release at this point and a website. And, uh, you know, I was expecting like some kind of grand plan and I wanted a plan and I wanted to be able to go to some of these vendor sites today and see that they're you know they they put this association together 
they've been uh, you know following the standards for a month or two or whatever and be able to get this juice and and see how their age verification works and and uh, you know stuff like that none of it's implemented I don't know when it's going to be implemented is it going to actually come to fruition um, you know like and, and I'm not attacking them it's just I don't I feel like it's it needs more time in in the oven and uh, you know I don't fault them for announcing it now um, but I would have to have seen all of the information up front. right and I agree I, I agree to a certain extent um, going through here and having actually had firsthand sort of uh, experience in a juice room uh, I like a lot of the stuff that I see in here um, and I'll go through some of it at some point but we have a caller on the line so a uh, caller from an unknown area code uh, go ahead you're on vape link hello hey Kazi hey bagel hey guys hey. it's Scott hey Scott um, I, I heard about this today when I got home from work uh, someone brought it to my attention and I have to be honest with you, I am actually totally against this. Um, this kind of falls in the same realm of NVC. Um, not that I'm saying they're, you know, directly exactly like it, but it's the same concept. You know, right. making these rules and, and if you want to be part of this, this organization, you have to be um, basically compliant with all these these I don't. I, I haven't read through the whole list, but I've got a. I've got a list here. First of all, you guys are talking about cost. I think it was you, Basil. I'm sorry. We're talking yep. about the cost of it, the 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 increase in cost for the vendor and the supplier. Well, here's the increased cost in vendor and supplier, which I've, which you know, again, going through the list real quick. The vendors and suppliers have to pay for these people to come out and do random inspections. They have to pay their travel costs, their plane costs. Well, I think their... that's I think that's part of the the membership dues. That's what it goes to fund. In looking at um, the the response on ECF, so I don't think that that's an additional out of cost um, for for someone who wants to be certified. Well, I don't. Again, I don't know what the exacts are. Things are you know clarifications are still being made. You know questions are being answered. But you know, for I believe it's four hundred and twenty-five dollars a month to be part of this, out of your costs, in order to be part of this organization. That's crazy. Plus, not only that, think about it this way: if the FDA comes in and starts making regulations, right? Which we all know, sooner or later, they're going to do. They're going to get around to it. When they come in and make these regulations. This, this organization's regulations are going to be null and void. So why not wait until the FDA comes in with their regulations and puts it on, you know, black and white on paper and says, this is what you need to do, and then spend your, your you know, your backup money or your reserve on coming up to date and up to standards with FDA standards. Um, you know, I'm... <laughs> I don't know. I just have, I, there's so much information out there right now and there's so much flying around yeah. that it's hard to keep up with. Can I, it really is. I, I, and I'm not advocating specifically for this group because I, I, you know, whenever something starts, whether it's a trade organization or a show or a forum or a study, you never know how it's going to come out, right? So right. You, you never know whether this is going to be a good thing until we get it six months or a year out or maybe further. Uh, but, you know, the other organization that's trying to do this kind of work is Tveca, the TVECA. And they're reaching out to the FDA, as I understand it, or at least this is what the rumor mill says to me, that they're, they're reaching out to the FDA and they're advocating for pre-filled cartridges only and pre-filled cartomizers only. And we don't even have any transparency whatsoever. And so... Mm -hmm. When I look at this, I go, well, at least I know what the rules are. Well, right. You know. Well, think about yeah. Think about it this way though too. If they're releasing, let's say again, uh, you know, the group here is releasing standards that people should follow by if they want to become part of the organization. 
if they're putting out press releases like this, what is this saying to the FDA? We don't know what we're doing. We're just, you know, mixing juice in our bathtub. You know, this this makes us look like we don't know what the hell we're talking about. When in a, in you know, in reality, we have people that are safe, you know, health conscious, safety conscious. They're making sure that the stuff is sterile, that they're trying to be as clean as possible. Um, you know, there's vendors out there that are mixing in as clean of rooms as they can make. You know, yeah, there's there's uh, household mixers out there, but you know what? There's yet to be a proven case of uh, illness or death. Besides, obviously, the whole debacle with um, with the nicotine levels that were discovered, right. but we're we're managing quite well. You know, I I don't know, and I you, you know, cause you mentioned something about the age verification thing too. Yeah. Age verification is a click of the mouse. That's it. Um, Unless you know, it's any- a third-party bolt-in service, you're right. Yeah, and the third-party bolt-in that uh, that works is called idology.com, I think is one of them. Uh, I just checked, and Nexus Lexus does provide that service, or it's a service that they will have online shortly. Um, okay. And I, you know, I, I'm just, the only reason I'm bringing that up is that I'm researching along this with the rest of you. And even though, uh, you know, admittedly, I know some of the people that are involved with this, um, I, I, I tend to research and document separately. So that's why I'm bringing that up to you. I'm, I, 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 I think you have a right to your, yeah. your, your absolute opinion, Scott. And, and, and I think it's very, very good that when something like this comes up, that we are critical about it. Not critical from the standpoint of just tearing it apart, but asking the questions that are being asked. Because it does right. matter to our community. You know. Well, there were some things in this, and, and I, did you get a chance to read the PDF? For I've, Like I said, I've, I've been, I got home from work, had some things to do. I skimmed over it quickly as somebody sent me a link, probably, you know, right. probably about six this evening but um there's there's a number of things here that i th- that I, there's some things here that i really liked one of the things that i really liked was uh in section 2.05 the following will not be added or used in the creation of e-liquids diacetol whole tobacco alkaloids and, uh, any kind of medicine prescription or prescription medicinal uh, illegal or controlled substances, caffeine, vitamins or dietary supplements, uh, and there's a caveat, there's an exception there for other than for preservative purposes, and uh, that sounds how good about, to me. How about this one? How about no food coloring? You know, I don't want yeah, to face some, the rain. There was some talk of that in one of the kind of reactionary comments from, yeah. from uh, I think it was actually from Lou Ritter. Um, and they're, well, I, I think, I undecided on it in some Twitter. in some ways because there haven't been really any studies to prove that it's it's harmful or harmless as an inhalant. No, so they're no, not I, really I, sure. I but yeah, no, that's, I, a, that's an absolutely I just, great. I don't question. like the looks of it. I don't like the looks of it. Sometimes it just to me, um, you know, and I look at, I try and look at things outside the box. I play to try to play devil's advocate, but a lot of things here, you know, just these regulations and the restrictions and the, you know, specifically, uh, what was the one here, the uh, WTA. Um, what, what's the big deal about a WTA? I mean, it's 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 an extract from the tobacco leaf, which what is nicotine? It's an extract from the tobacco leaf. Uh, it, you it, know it, it is the problem I would have. Now, this is just from a vaping standpoint. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody for using them. Uh-huh. I I don't want to retobacconate. Uh, you know my my. Uh, I don't want to retobacconate my my e liquid. I I want all the alkaloids out as much as possible, with the exception of 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 nicotine. Uh, and and that's just been my personal feeling on it. All right. Well, I mean, like everybody, everybody does. I mean, has an opinion, has an, you know, a certain taste for different flavors. As proven, some people like flavors, some certain flavors, some don't. 
Um, yeah, no, but, I, I, I understand. I, I don't think that there's, well, my point is, is I don't think there's an answer to whether this is good or bad yet. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's you know, my you know, position. I, I, I want to jump back to that online um, verification of age. So, you know, I want to point out that I just found apparently uh, Blue Sig has some sort of verification going on that actually launched last month. Uh, but here's here's my problem with this is you you can think of this just like um, you know when uh, people who have pirated music get sued by the music industry and the defense is always well you don't know who is behind the computer right we you don't know if if I'm like 15 and my parents set me up with a PayPal account and you know say that you could use PayPal eventually in the future you know, or my parents let me use their credit card to make some orders, or I swipe my parents' credit card. If you're if you're under 18, chances are that your internet connection is not in your name. I I, I just think that it is a nearly impossible task. It's something that we are going to have to eventually face, which is that we are going to have to go to a brick and mortar to get our e-liquid, whether we're I mean even if we're allowed to continue to buy e-liquid in a bottle. I, I don't I, agree with that because in order to do that, what you would have to do is you, uh, you would have to go to a brick and mortar for your pornography and you'd have to go for, to a brick and mortar for cigars, which can still be sold online. And so there's several legal problems with, uh, with the, that happening from an age verification standpoint. It could happen under the family, uh, the tobacco, the Family Tobacco Act Protection Act, and I'm, I'm I'm saying it incorrectly, which prohibits the online sales. Uh, but you're not going to be able. I don't think you'll be able to do it from a from an age verification standpoint, because what they're advocating for in this document is a higher age verification than most pornography sites have. Don't ask me how I know. Well, well, does <laughs> does uh, age verification on a pornography site actually work? Well, there there sure, was a credit card number. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah there again, was a sure with the credit card out number. Of mom or dad's wallet, I think. Yeah, credit, but you can always you always run that risk. Look, I always, I grew up in a household where really, if I wanted to be a deviant and go and swipe a credit card, I could have. I never did, but you know, if I wanted to, I could. Whether there's a will, there's a way. It's just like when I was under eighteen, I still bought cigarettes. You know, there there were people who would sell them to me, and then there were people who would buy them for me. You know, so so. Online, uh, it's a it's a monster of a task, and to to not tell me how you're going to do it, you know what the technology is. But I want to know that, like I, I not because like I'm, I want to attack them. I want to know that because I'm interested in in how you plan on doing that, and if you're going to implement it, uh, you know, or if you're going to say that you're going to implement it, I think that you should like you know give me some more information as to how you're going to do that. Just like how the tests are going to be run, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I, I don't know. I like I said, I think it's half baked. It's going to be a horrendous task. It's going to be. It's absolutely horrendous. There's no sure way to verify. The only way you verify is an electronic signature, which is your IP address and clicking I accept. Um, you know. Uh, other than shipping it through UPS and having signature verification of who's who's taking it, I, I, they can't even check your age at the door uh, that I know of. Um, but not to keep dragging this on, guys, I just want to get one more subject, one more thing that I noticed in this, and that is the, the listing of the board. There is, you know, there's, there's board members in there that are owners and operators of e-cigarette shops. There's board members on there that are moderators at a the world's largest forum for e-cigarettes. There is, you know, conflict of interest there. I really I kind of see a conflict of interest. I I wouldn't want to be on a board that has to do with the legalities because it just doesn't. It just doesn't seem right to me. Bottom line. Well, you know, and let's also that, let's I don't also know the eat. professional background of any of these people. But one thing that I'm surprised is that they don't have anyone who's uh, stated legal counsel of any sort. 
Um, I would think that it, it, the way this is probably going to go, they're going to need someone who has a law, you know, license somewhere to be affiliated with this group. Uh, because, you, you, I mean, you're granted it's all voluntary, but I think there's still the ramification uh, for something to become a legal matter at some point, right? I mean, there's oh, yeah. still... I Gonna, there's still you still run the risk that uh, somebody could pick up a bottle of liquid, or a, a child could pick up a bottle of liquid sold by one of these uh, vendors that are approved, and drinks it and get sick, and you know frivolous lawsuits and, and those sorts of things. I think that that at some point they've got to have somebody who is their stated legal counsel, wouldn't they? I would hope so, and that's the reason why you would have to get the you know. That's more money out of your pocket there, and I don't think four hundred and twenty-five a month is going to cover your lawsuit. Um, you know, they can say, "Well, I'm following the standards of this organization." You're right; they could be sued for it. Um, but again, that's on their that's on their hands if they decide to join an organization and follow that organization's recommendations. So that's bottom line. Well, you know, I so, do guys, I do think. I do think that no matter what, you know, there, there's uh, there's no way to. Do we just lose video? Cos. Uh oh. I'm just doing my production stuff. Hang on a second. We have a. Uh, we have an EMSA. Uh, we have a board member from um, the new organization who says they'd like to call in. So, okay, I'll, I'll let you guys go. You guys the, have a good night then. Well, Scott, you Thanks, can. Scott. You can you can stay on if you want. I'm going to bring him in through a separate Skype instance, so just give me a moment here. Okay. Uh, you guys carry on with your discussion, and I will bring him here. So, uh, what was I, I, I was saying that no matter what, no matter what organization or what stamp of approval you have, there's always a possibility, even with child safety uh, caps, that a child could get hurt by this stuff. And I'll be honest with you, I have e-liquid all over my house. And I have a, a two-year-old nephew and a six-year-old niece. And they are, I, I, it's not like they're not allowed over my house, but I wouldn't let them over my house unless I locked a box with all of my e-liquid in it and put it up on a top shelf in the kitchen or something like that. Just because, you know, I, it scares me to death to have them around this stuff. I don't vape in front of them. They don't, they've never seen me vape, um, and I don't bring e-cigarettes around them, uh, just because it, you know it's. Uh, I think it's a sticky sticky situation. So I don't think that you could put a lawsuit on the organization if something happened to a child. Um, I'm sure that somebody could try and sue a vendor, uh, but you know I, I don't really I don't really see that as a major argument. Well, look, water. <laughs> Guys, just keep going. I'm trying to add something dynamically. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, while causes, I mean, you know, I, I, I still, I, w I will circle back around to this though. I mean, I, I still do love the idea of being able to potentially self-regulate uh, because as, as someone who wants as little government interference in his life uh, at all facets as possible, I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, and I think it's probably going to, you know, get to where we need to be. I really hope that for the most part it is uh, very much so still a work in progress. Um, yeah, and, the other and thing I think too, that I would be curious to see in, in worrying about uh, from a potential corruption standpoint, and this is probably even a down the line thing, but how do we know as the end consumer that just because this group has stamped off on something, how do we know it's really happening behind the scenes other than their word? Does that make sense? I mean, well, is yeah. there going to be published footage? Is there going to be, you know, all, all those things um, that the community would really want to see? I mean, is that, that going to be made available? Videos of walkthroughs, et cetera. You know, okay, I, I also have to say it's a trade, trade organization, right? So, you know, by definition, it's the vendors, right? Yes, True. I would think so. Um, we have Link, who's on the board of the new organization here. Link, are you are you in and uh, communicating? 
I can hear you. Can you hear me? I sure oh, can. Link, how you doing, bud? Hey, Basil. Hey, Link. What's going on, Link? Oh, it's good Not to much. see you. It's, uh, it's been a long day, but uh, I'm glad you could have me on. I'm glad that you could come on. Um, we, while we're obviously having an open discussion here, I apologize to you, Link. I wasn't set up for a fourth person on video tonight. Oh, that's fine. I'll turn off my video and say bandwidth then. There you go. Uh, but I, I, I will be if you guys want to come on next week. Um, absolutely, we'll, we'll come on next week. Uh, oh. But you guys had questions, and I wanted to come in uh, and answer. Uh, Fantastic. Let's, let's line them up. Uh, Scott or JK, who are both on a conference call here with us. Do you guys JK? have questions? Oh. He's in there. Oh, man. Hi. Hi, JK. I'd actually, I'm, I'm actually just going to sit here and let Link do his thing for us. Hey, Link, how are you? Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right, well, we've got the man, guys. Go to it. Mike? So I guess, you know, my real interest is the age verification. How's that? How's that going to work? Is there a plan set up for that? Or are you guys still figuring it out? Or okay, well let, let me let me back up a second and and you do it. So the standards are put out there, but the one thing that as an organization, AIMSA does not do is tell you how to run your vi your business. So nowhere in here will you say you must have this specific test or this specific technology. Now we do have identified, um, and I can't tell you off the top of my head the names. There are age verification systems. Uh, that are available. There are multiple vendors that are already using these age verification systems. Um, and they're not just a simple click here to say that you're 18. They're actually what's called active age verification. Um, and in, you, in the standards document, we actually even define out what the definition of that. And that's taking active measures to ensure that all customers are of legal age. It can be accomplished in many ways, including photo identification, third party verification systems. Note, having a pop-up box asking a person to indicate that they're over a specified age is not active age verification. So it's a step further when we do it. It's actually the same thing that is put on wine sellers and tobacco sellers today. Okay. Um, so, so, I mean, I guess, you know, you said that you're not forcing anybody to, um, you know, run their business a certain way, but by having standards, aren't you kind of forcing them to run their business a certain way? And and if and, um, and if you are going to have standards, you know, shouldn't there be some like like uh, maybe something more stringent? As in, like we want you to use this age verification. We want you to run these specific tests. Uh, and I know you have a chemist on the board, and uh, a rather famous chemist in our uh, circle. So like. You know, maybe he could set up like specific tests that the e-liquid goes through, and uh, you know, maybe have the people that test it have like some kind of uh, communication with him so that uh, you know to ensure that the tests are being done you know up to the standards. I mean, when I think of standards, I'm like, okay, you follow these standards. There, it's a set of rules, right? So well, like to leave it kind of open for interpretation or for however you decide that you want to do these tests. Um, it just seems, you know, like I said before, a little half-baked. Um, it's not really half-baked. If you think about it, when you own a business and uh, standards are put out in front of you, one of your primary prin principal responsibilities is to figure out how do I live up to that standard. Now, if I as a standard bearer say that you can, you have to use this specific test or you have to use this specific technology, I'm actually telling you how to run your business. When the reality is out there, for example, for nicotine uh, validation and to meet our quality standards, we tell them what they have to meet for the quality and that they have to be able to prove that by using evidentiary documentation from either their supplier or them testing it themselves. Um, but if I were to say that you have to use GCMS for that, when in reality there are any number of combinations of chemistry tests that can be used. So you get to decide as a business, how do you meet that criteria that fits your business best, as opposed to trying to stamp somebody into a one mold fits all. So then, I, I mean, I guess then kind of uh, each member is going to set up how they're going to, you know, what their steps are. They're going to have to plan it. Right? How they're going to do it? I mean, what if what if they aren't doing it? Um, 
you know, well? What if the well, the, the tests aren't, you know, uh, aren't, you know, so vendor A does it a certain way and, you know, their results are more favorable to vendor B that's doing it a different way. I mean, how do you, how do you, there's going to be variations on how everybody does this. I, I do still think that by definition standards, you know, is sort of telling people how to run their business in, in a broader sense than saying, okay, it's very stringent. It's still sort of saying you're going to live up to these standards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're saying you live up to standards. And one thing also to remember here, this is purely volunteer. This is vendors who read the, uh, the standards, who read our mission and our goals, and who want to be a part of it. No one is forcing anybody. We're not even you know, advocating that, that, that people have to join, and we're not policing anybody within it. This is an entirely volunteer organization. Just like in my uh, company where if I want to be ISO 9000, I read those standards, I see what, the, what I, obligations I'm up to, uh, have to live up to, and then I implement a business plan to come to those. At which point, when I'm ready, I invite ISO out, I pay them the fee that's come to come out and verify that all my processes are in place, and I become ISO 9001 certified. It's the exact same process that we're talking about here. So, Link, let me get this straight. So, with this, on your, your manual or on the PDF, you're saying that random inspections. So, you're saying the 425 or whatever it was a month for the fee uh, is not going to cover your organization, one of the representatives coming out to inspect their facility? Actually, we're saying the opposite of that. The budget is the, and the dues were based on our budget and our goals. Uh, for, for, that includes planning for one to one and a half inspections per year per member. Uh, so that's an actual site visit. Now we will do things that we can to make sure economy of scale so that our money goes as far as possible um, mm -hmm. for those things. But the, that is the, the plan within it. Um, and the member has to agree to both scheduled and unscheduled uh, inspections to be able to actually go in and see the environment that they are, have uh, or facility that they've uh, put to the information forward to, to get their certification. Okay. So that $425 covers that. I think what you're confusing with is there is a section in the Mentor-Protégé program. Mentor-Protégé program is that uh, small businesses that can't afford the financial uh, insulin can apply to become a protégé. A protégé has no fees, membership fees whatsoever, but they are responsible that if it's deemed necessary to come out for a site visit, that they're responsible to pay for that site visit, which we think is a very reasonable thing. Okay. Now, one other question that when I had, before you had called in, I had, I had told the, uh, told Kaz and, and Basil and, and voiced that, do you guys have a concern about your board members being business owners? Do you think that in an independent group would be, would be better for board members? I understand you guys, you know, it's good to have a chemist on, on hand and expertise, but wouldn't you guys feel better if you use them as consultants instead of board members themselves? Okay, well, I, I understand if this were a public organization or things along those lines. The fact is, this is a trade organization. Okay? It's paid for and funded by the members, and the members are the vending uh, community. Now, we have set up a system so that, one, nobody can take control of it. So unlike Taveca or SAFTA or any of those other organizations where based on your size of your revenue, you can get a greater share and basically effectively eliminate the little guy. Everyone's an equal vote within the organization. As well as we have consumer advocates for the express purpose of making sure that things go uh, and have the, the consumers have a voice in it. As well as subject matter experts. Both consumer advocates and subject matter experts can be on the board of directors. So they can directly influence. In fact, the president of this organization is not a vendor whatsoever. He's a consumer advocate. It's there. And it, it, in my opinion, it works well to have that because you end up getting a balance uh, as it goes through. Well, you know, so I, how I, often does I, the board I, get reshuffled then? 
Okay. So right now we have a provisional board. Obviously, we had a small number uh, of vendors. We had nine vendors. We did an election. The members that are on there were elected by the member charter members that were available at their time. We're setting a, a next threshold, which will be a certain number of members, somewhere between 20 and 25 members, at which point we will hold a general election. So, so you know, I don't have a problem because this is a trade organization. I don't have a problem with vendors. This is, that's the, by definition, it's, it's vendors, right? You know, this is self-regulation. So, therefore, it's the vendors who are regulating themselves. Um, you know, so are there going to be checks and balances, right? So, I'm vendor A and I've done my tests and here's my results and you can come and take a look and I'll clean up and be tidy when you come and take a look or if I don't know, you know, hopefully I'm clean and tidy when you come and take a look. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, is there going to be, you know, a member, uh, Link, are you the chemist? No, 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 no. Uh, Link, Link is the uh, is the progenitor of the We Are Vapors project. He's okay, been very okay. Active yeah, in the community. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to excuse me because I'm, I, you know, I, sometimes people talk about these people and I don't know who they are. Um, I've heard of them, but I don't know specifically. But like, okay, so you have a chemist. W will that chemist, you know, he's tested e-liquid before. Will he be sent? you know, uh, some samples just to, you know, verify. Um, we haven't gotten into that level of detail, but the initial process is the evidentiary documentation is provided. And we have a chemist to be able to look and see that the tests that are being done are actually legit um, with it. it. Will there be a point um, where we may hire a separate laboratory to do independent verification? Well. When we feel that there's a need for that, that's something that the organization has the capability to do, but at this point, we don't yet. So uh, on uh, the other question that you had, how is compliance? We have uh, not only a, a standards committee that's being formed, so that how the standards are written, collecting feedback, getting the input of not only the members, but the community on what those standards should be, churning those things through, really helping flesh out the, the issues of it. But we also have a compliance committee whose jo entire job is to, is to lay out the process and procedure for very verifying uh, compliance. So the current set of standards for sterilization and um, basically you know, amounting to having a safe working space, where, did the, where were those drafted? What was the, the kind of guiding or guidance that that those were the really guiding the guiding principle came from the FDA's food manufacturing standards. Okay. Um, so that was the 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 starting point. Some of them applied, some of them didn't um, apply. Uh, so these weren't just pulled out of thin air. Uh, we actually started from a base that's already a regulatory example, and uh, add it uh, add it to that. Okay. So, Link, first off, you have to understand that when something like this comes out in the community, people have questions. So I, I, I don't want you to feel like you're entering a hostile situation. But oh, I'm sorry has, if I sound like that. I just you, get excited. Oh, it, it's okay. We get excited, too. Um, I still love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that, okay, I'm reading through this, and I have some juice experience. And I'm reading through this, and I'm seeing some things that I very much like, and I see some things I don't know how they're going to work. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is this doesn't have to work for me. This has to work for vendors. So the, the measurement, I think, is going to be whether vendors adopt your policy, isn't it? And, and, and yes. will your standards and policy be there for people to be able to conform to it without actually being members? Um, absolutely, they can conform to it. That's why we publish uh, the standards. In fact, we're the only one of the trade organizations in this industry that actually publicly puts the standards out. So you so, see what it is. You don't have to join in order to comply with the standards. In fact, you can use them and, and go through. Will you be AIMS certified and have say that the, the organization has verified that? No. Uh, but that's you know one of the points of the, of the standards being out there. Anybody can take the standards and say, I want to use this as a baseline and change X, Y, and Z for my particular business. So, and that's, so, that's exactly. 
I, I'm sorry. Let me just finish up, Mike, and then I'll give the ball over to you. Sure. So, uh, now we went through this, and I, you know, I guess I'm biased in the positive because I know you uh, a lot of the guys that formed this organization, and uh, I, I wish I would have had more notice on it because I was I'm really interested in what you're doing, but there's there's you know. I hope you don't feel like you're playing defense against the entire community because I know a lot of people are sort of probably nipping at your heels right now. Uh, I, I'm i stumbling with my thoughts here. You know, I think there's some really good things in that outline. I think it's got to work for vendors. I, would, I guess the question is, is that if a company adhered to those standards, would, and I'm talking to the audience here, would you vape that juice? if they adhere to those standards and and if that was if the answer is yes then perhaps what they're doing has great value and that's how i'm looking at it and i'll turn it over to mike well so actually i so I have two points i want to talk about what you just said uh... i actually me personally um, I, I think that from a marketing standpoint uh... having uh, you know this this little mark that says you adhere to these standards. I think that that works. I think that it will make people more inclined to buy from vendor A versus you know vendor Z who who doesn't adhere to these standards. I recently bought some USA made e liquid that I know exactly where it came from, and um, you know because I knew exactly where it came from and I know that uh, they're considered a uh, they they actually sell to a whole lot of vendors. And I know that um, you know they have good quality juice and that it's not watered down or anything like that. And I bought it specifically because of that. Um, you know, it didn't have a stamp on it or anything like that, but you know, nonetheless, I, I think that uh, you know it's just like people who buy USA made e liquid. They buy it because it's USA made. They and the thought is that it's better because it's USA made. Right? It, it may not always be the case. But um, I guess, you know, so that's my point on that. Um, I do think that it will uh, sway people's decisions. Uh, my, my second point that I wanted to get to um, was people who aren't actually members can um, adhere to these standards. So, so I could list all of these standards on my website like if I was a vendor right so say I'm vendor A and I list all these standards and, and I check off next to each one of them and I don't even mention your organization right and uh, you know so now I'm telling the people who buy from me that I adhere to these standards and if all of the people who are members of this adhere to these standards in a different way right so that they, they do different tests um, you know they do different age verification I know I know I'm repeating myself um, you know then what makes it special right like like if there was like you know we figured out definitely that you need to do test A B C and D and you you know this is the best age verification we looked into it we did our research and and you know this has the most positive results uh, like I think that there's value in that, and I know that it's being more stringent, but I, I do believe that there's more value in that than saying, you know, here's our guidelines and, and adhere to them however you wish, because then you're looking at you got a list of what you know, ten vendors or eight vendors or something like that that are adhering to these standards in different ways, uh, and you know now the standards are published and anybody can adhere to them in any way that they want. So why pay to? You know, like, I don't know, maybe a little bit more stringent would be better. I mean, I can ap appreciate that, um, that, that, you know, thought behind it. And, you know, there's a reality when it comes to standards about where is that fine line uh, between being too stringent and then killing the industry and providing the effects that we want. We really took a lot of time going through and deciding how to word these standards how they apply, doing the research uh, behind them. Could somebody take them and go implement them? I encourage them to do that. Even if they don't join AMSA, because that would give me, as a consumer, greater peace of mind, knowing that there are some standards uh, that they're doing within it. But AMSA is more than just the standards. We also have goals about actually having a voice with the FDA. Right now, the e-liquid manufacturers have no voice with the FDA only. 
they have Enjoy, and they have Blue, and they have Teveca, and they have all of those in the FDA uh, having meetings and talking about what the future of regulation is, and our community and industry has no voice in that. So one of the reasons to join is to have a voice. You don't think Johnson Creek doesn't have a voice in this? Since they're supplying the juice for blue? I'm sure they I'm sure they do. I'm sure they're attempting to go directly to um direct, directly to the FDA or through uh Lorillard to to influence the FDA, but does Johnson Creek represent the small business? I mean, all of these uh, members that are on this uh, to date are all small businesses. They're not these multi-million dollar co corporations. Well, you Correct. know what? As, as far as Johnson Creek goes, I mean, what do they even care about their uh, their bottled juice business when they're providing uh, pre-filled cartos to Blue? So, I mean, that's the way I feel about that. That's probably the majority of their business at this point. Well, at this point, yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to, to touch back on here is uh, the standards or the, the requirements. There is, don't get me wrong, there's some requirements in there that should just ought to be, automatically be a given. But those are more or less common sense requirements. Um, the other thing I have a question about is, Link, has your organization come up with a, a I guess basically a, a price list of what it would cost the average Joe Schmo to come up to the, those standards that you have listed in your PDF file. Um, you know, stainless steel, uh, you know, cleaning, cleaning supplies, things like that. What would it cost a person starting out from the bottom? Say like, uh, you know, e-cig supply or, or uh, you know, DIY Flavor Shack, the people that have been around forever, that are small companies, just like everybody else around here, how much is it going to cost them, bottom line, starting out to come up to your standards that you have listed? Uh, and the fact is, we just implemented these standards. So we're still gathering that information. When we have that information, okay. it is something that, that we want to uh, provide. Not only just the standards, but I'd love to be able to, as an organization, to put out and say, look, you're interested in uh, a stainless steel table. Well, here's some ones that our, previous, our current members are using. Consider looking at these. Because there is a wide variety, and every business is different um, with it. So there, there is no kind of one stock piece fits all. But sharing that information. Now, you get, one thing I want to understand is these guys, I, I brought these guys together and uh, started this. They're all competitors but they're coming together and they're working and putting their bottom line aside and looking at what's, what they feel is best for the industry and how to put that model and example out there. Noah's saying this is how the industry has to run, but they're saying, look, this is what we agree and what we feel uh, should be put into place and is reasonable and, and attainable. Okay. Now, is your, is your company in the process or, or your organization in the process of obtaining organization papers also because you guys are listed as an organization? We are, we are uh, incorporated in the, the state of Ohio. Um, okay. We uh, are incorporated as a trade association. Um, okay. okay. And we're furthering more, et cetera, like uh, the bylaws are currently under review with the with the law firm that we've engaged, um, and we do have legal representation um, uh, for this. So we're, uh, we're, we're really uh, putting this together. Now, you know, we've got experienced business people that have, have put this together, that have grown their businesses from the ground up right. in this industry. So they understand kind of the challenges, as well as you have Lou Ritter, who has uh, extensive experience in regulation in the construction industry. Um, and then myself, who just pretty much does anything and everything, including my day job for the Department of Treasury. Uh, so we're, we're, we didn't just like throw darts at a dartboard. We really thought about it. But that being said, these standards are a living document. The members really end up shaping it. So that's why we want more membership to come in and give their voice uh, towards it. So in other words, what you're talking about here is, is a situation where 
as people join the organization, you're going to see things changed uh, or potentially changed because it's you're going to be reflective of your membership. Is that uh, that process? <coughs> excuse me, that process is locked into your bylaws. Um, it is locked in, uh, so things can uh, happen. There are checks and balances within it, including checks and balances that are based on our five core beliefs that we've published. Okay. Now, I are you guys going to be transparent with funds, with uh, with dues, and everything? Or are you guys are you guys going to be a non you non for profit, or are you for profit, or how we is are, that going to work? We, we are uh, applying for the non for profit, not for or sorry, non profit. Um, okay. uh, specifically, so we will have very specific accounting and, and transparency uh, that has to be in place for that. Okay. So someday, uh, I mean, what's what's kind of the magic, uh, you know, treasury fund, if you will? I mean, at what point uh, do you guys have so much money built up that you either lower dues or, and maybe you're not comfortable sharing that, and I understand. Uh, but is there a contingency plan for the the day where maybe you're sitting on, I guess, fat sacks of cash, if you will? Mm -hmm. So there is actually built into our, there is actually built into our budgeting and finance process a review of the annual dues based on uh, what we want to accomplish, and the members have direct input into whether that those membership fees stay what they are, go up or go down based on the goals that the the organization wants to accomplish within that 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 physical year. Yeah, because I think, um, you know, that's one of the things, and there's some, some juice vendors in the chat here, um, or some that are maybe just looking to start, and I, that seems to be a real big sticking point for them, is that they feel like this is being forced on them in some ways. And again, it is voluntary, and I understand that. I'm not trying to refute that point. Uh, but I think the cost associated seems like a pretty big barrier for an upstart business to get, to get in. And I know that you can pay uh, as you go, month by month, but... Uh, to start out, the cost does seem pretty steep. Um, the cost is based on the goals uh, that we want. And, you know, we had to establish a budget, set target numbers for what we thought membership was going to be, and then essentially derive what the dues would be to make those goals based on their, our anticipated membership. Um, so it's highly possible this time next year or when uh, actually – the next budget review is actually starts in November and is finalized in December. Um, there's a possibility that that could that could change. With more membership, we have more uh, essentially uh, funds to be able to accomplish uh, what we want. Um, so, so there are checks and balances in there, so that this organization is dynamic and survives the long run and just doesn't become a big pot of money for somebody to collect and say we want to go do X, Y, and Z. I've gotten, so, uh, Mike, uh, I've got questions from the audience if you want to finish up. Me? Well, let's jump yeah. to some of those. Let's jump to some of those. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting, and, and, and Link, I really appreciate you coming on because this was unannounced uh, that that you were going to come on. And, you know, we're, we're kind of an unmoderated show, so <laughs> you're going to get all views. Uh, yeah. So the question that I have that came in here, which is interesting, is will the board members be drawing a salary? Absolutely not. There's actually specific provisions in our bylaw that there's no yeah, remuneration uh, for the, the board members. It is included in there that we do if we have a need to, day, say, do an independent verification of, of nicotine tests, that we have the ability uh, to pay uh, for services and for a salary if, say, we decided a long-term chemist that needs to be dedicated full-time is in there. But the board members do not receive... Uh, any salary or remuneration is there um, the other one is and this was this was regarding the nonprofit status uh, and I'm I'm, and I'm I'm only asking this because the answer that you gave not that it was unclear but it wasn't answering this specific question when you say in process is your are your papers in at this point are they being considered so we have been approved by the state of Ohio as a trade organization as we all know, the process goes through a first year approved yes. as a trade organization. Then we have to submit a three-year uh, budget and the bylaws for review and those type of items. That process starts after after VaporCon. There being the, everything's being reviewed by the lawyer for does it all the I's dotted and the T's crossed and correcting my horrible spelling mistakes because anybody who knows me knows that I can't spell 
to save my life um, and put that through it. But so it is a it, it is a process. Um, right. As you probably remember going through with Kassa, it's not oh, yeah. a simple apply. No, it's not. Um, the other one that, that came in here, and there's so many of them, Link, you're, you're going to attract questions like you wouldn't believe here. This comes from a smaller vendor that's out there who makes juice uh, and some mods and that kind of stuff, and I don't know if they want me to... No, they don't want me to say who it is. Okay. Uh, is this only about safety, or will it venture out in trying to keep things like juice uh, from being sold through the mail or, or, or that type of thing? Are you, are you going to address the shipping of these products at all? Okay, so we actually in the standards address the safety of shipping, but we fully support online sales and the ability to sell via the mail. And that's our position and that's the position that we would take at any table that we're invited to. Um, right. As well as we support selling e-juice in bottles for our own refill. Okay, and we have absolutely opposed limiting it to two cartomizers only right so uh, the 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 fees that you you get um, I, I assume that that's going to end up going towards uh, lobbying then at which point in time in which we have the state of Ohio and federal government's approval that we can engage in lobbying activities yes one of the intended purposes is is lobbying activities I mean, I think that that's good. Right. So essentially, you're hitting a number of points at the top of the nail, so to speak. You're you're dealing with the juice quality. You're supporting vendors with perhaps technical information that they don't have, uh, and you're going after lobbying after a significant period of time. I assume you're going to be at least 12 months out before you're going to be able to really lobby hard. Yeah, well, lobbying has two factors. One, we have to get the state and federal approval to be able to do it. The second is we have to have the funds to do it. Yeah. Okay. And we, so you have, I, to, you have to get more members. Yes. And I, I apologize. Yeah. I have questions flying in here, if you wouldn't <laughs> believe. How, yeah. and, and you might Let have, me just state one other thing real quick. Sure. Which is, even though we can't lobby, there's a big difference between sitting down at the table with the FDA and lobbying. So there's yes. nothing that is stopping us from right now from being able to go to the FDA and say, we'd like to show you these standards. And these are things that we're investigating. I agree. So uh, this question may have already been covered, but this might have been someone who tuned in late, so you might want to restate this shortly. How is a registered member of uh, AESMA verified that they are following the standards? Okay. Well, we have a, a several step process. Um, so there's an actual application process where uh, they essentially describe how their production is and they provide both photo, documentation, and video evidence with it. Okay? Once they uh, uh, provide that information, they then go through an interview process where they're actually sitting down with the applications board um, and discussing how they run their business, the types of things that they do, all in a very private environment. So it's not a general membership uh, type of discussion because there are trade secrets and intellectual pro uh, uh, property that have to essentially be discussed. Um, and we also have a mutual non-disclosure disclosure agreement with every member so right. that they understand that there are actually are uh, legal liabilities uh, to disclosing other members' information. Um, gotcha. Once that is done, we then uh, schedule... Uh, for their first inspection, a scheduled inspection uh, to come out and visit their site once they say that they've gotten to that standard. Now often what is going to happen, as is the case with the members that are today, they're not fully compliant. So they don't have the AMSA certification yet. But each one of them by going through that process has seen where they are, are lacking and committed to a date on which they will be compliant. And every charter member that's in there now has committed by February 28th that they will be fully compliant. That includes the, uh, the actual initial inspection. What happens if they aren't? And who are the people that you're retaining to do the inspections? Okay. The uh, compliance committee is responsible for the inspections um, because we haven't populated that yet. I haven't, we haven't essentially put out the exact procedures of determining who goes and et cetera. Um, so that's, as a new organization, not every detail 
um, is worked out. But it is something that we are doing and will have in place before uh, before the February deadline. Um, so yeah, we're also looking at potentially in the future having third party verification, but we're not to that point uh, within the organization. Okay. Do you guys have any other questions? Are there any other questions from uh, our audience? Uh, you, uh, Scott, are you still there? Yes, I am. No, I don't have any more, and I'll I'll go ahead and jump off the line here. Okay. Okay. Well, Scott, I just wanted to address something that you had mentioned earlier. Just so you know, none of the board members are ECF moderators, um, and even though there's not a lawyer uh, part of the board. We do have have retained counsel that is uh, representing us, but the trades or organization is not covering the liabilities of the individual members. It's not part of what the the, the organization is offering as a service. Okay. If there are additional questions and you would like to call in eight four seven four two three eight five eight one or private message me, which fourteen people just did. <laughs> what happens if someone who is certified and then gets sued, who pays the attorney? Are you guys providing a legal indemnification fund of any kind? We do not. We do not offer that as a, uh, as a, as a service. At some point in the future, if membership grows and the, the funds are available, that may be uh, a possibility. But it is not something that's currently... So a question for you, if I recall back to my restaurant days correctly, um, you know, FDA has certain codes for food handling and things, uh, but a lot of those are superseded, if I recall correctly, by, by local health department codes. Um, is that a concern here for you guys? Or, uh, I mean, well, that because depends. that gives you potentially 50 plus more sets of codes and standards to have to try and, and keep in mind as well. Yeah, so we're based on the federal standard because right now there is no health organization that is doing any kind of inspection uh, on e-juice manufacturers or even treating it as a food manufacturing uh, type of facility. Uh, so we're not saying that you have to meet the food preparation standards for your local because it is very, and not only very state by state, it can vary county by county uh, right. within that. Um, so we used as the starting point the federal manufacturing standards. Got it. Are there additional questions, guys? Bring them in. 847-423-8581. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of sitting here. I, I, don't think, I don't think this is a step in the wrong direction, necessarily. Um, I still think that the, the biggest subset of people you're going to have to win over, Link, is going to be the, the small vendors, the mom and pops, because... Yeah. For them, they look at this and just say, there's no way that financially I could ever afford this. And to them, they see it as a loss of business if they don't have the stamp. And I think that you, you guys are going to have to do a lot of PR to uh, dissuade people from feeling that way. And it's, it's not an attack. I'm just, uh, when I no, sit back I can... and look at this, I just, I think that, that as far as you guys are concerned on the board, that's something you guys are going to have to find a way to address. Yeah, and partly we address that with the mentor protege program. Um, you know, the fact is that any organization that you put together is not going to, to be able to meet 100% of everybody's needs. Um, our focus is on those businesses that are focusing on being professional e-liquid manufacturers, um, which is different than uh, some of the business models that other people uh, are putting out there. So you guys are doing a full presentation Wednesday on Vape Team, is that correct? Uh, yes, we have a segment. I don't know how long it is, but uh, we'll be there to, to talk with uh, the big team and answer questions kind of like we're doing here. Oh, well, I, I appreciate you coming in um, because I, I know you guys had uh, planned on being vape team ahead of time, and I appreciate you coming in. I, I'm trying to generate questions. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of commentary, <laughs> not a lot of questions at this point. Um, well, I did see something earlier. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, it was from Jason, from the vape team, uh, saying that it's better to you know regulate ourselves than have the FDA throw the book at us. Uh, so I would uh, I would assume that um, you know like taking his his thinking, um, I would assume that your goal is 
to engage with the, the uh, uh, FDA and say these are the standards that we're working with now and um, you know please review them see if you have any additions and we'll discuss it and hopefully we can come to an agreement on standards is it, I, well that's friendly, except for our first position is we have self-regulation. There is no need for this. Um, the history of the FDA, though, says chances are that's not going to work. So coming to the table and say, look, we have these standards. If we look at the history of uh, not only the FDA but other regula regulatory bodies, they often end up adjusting the industry's regulations, self-regulations that are already put into place. Um, and in putting best practices um, to go with it, with some modification um, to it. So the, all of these regulations are something that I would have no problem going in front of the FDA and saying, this is what you should do. And standing up a voice and saying, this is not only what you should do, look, we have X number of members that can show you that it's working. How does this, what you're doing, adapt to uh, vendors who do uh, just in time making of e-juice. Um, I know of a great many vendors where you go on the site and you choose what you want, how you want it flavored, what the juice is and whatever, and immediately it gets it gets created. And and some of those vendors are fairly large. Uh, mm -hmm. That could uh, easily, Juicy Vapor is one of our members. Yeah. Um, does. Who could, who could um, easily do that? How When you're dealing with a batch system, are you showing them how to create batch or how to create batch in an in a situation like that or is the batch numbers of the agree ingredients significant uh, use useful enough for your certification process yeah so the the key there is being able to have the process in place and the documentation to be able to trace back the ingredients of the e-liquid so both uh, um, juicy vapor and the, our other members that do just-in-time uh, type of manufacturing have put into a place a system so they can track back based on the individual bottle that has gone out what was the nicotine what was the the USP certified uh, PG and VG uh, that goes into it so that can be traced all the way back it's actually not as difficult as people imagine it to be it is a little bit of record-keeping that maybe some people are not quite used to uh, well no, it'll change it's, it's, I just want to say it'll change workflow and process quite a bit. But go 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 ahead, Mike. So, I'm sorry, Kaz. I don't mean to keep up on uh, button in. So, Link, is did you guys do you guys have an estimate of? Uh, so I assume that you know uh, vendors that are certified that are members, um, there may be a price increase. Is is there an estimated price increase per bottle? You know. 50, say 15 and mil, 30 mil bottle. Until that's, uh, it's actually fully implemented and they uh, start kind of recording that, uh, we won't be able to judge it. Um, so I can't give you an, any kind of uh, uh, estimate. So if, 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 if the general, um, you know, track record of um, going to the FDA and saying these are our standards we're regulating ourselves. If the general track record is that they don't just say, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, this is going to sound harsh, but what's the point? Link? I, I'm sorry. I, I lost the question mid seven you broke up. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so if the FDA generally doesn't uh, accept self-regulation, and uh, they they say, okay, well, th that's great, you're you're self-regulating, um, but tough, we're gonna regulate you how we want to regulate you, right? So, if, if that's the general track record of the FDA, then you know what I'm saying is not to be harsh, but. You know, what's the point then if the FDA is just going to regulate the industry as they see fit anyway? Well, one is the FDA's history um, is yes to say that they're going to intercede and actually impose regulation, but they do collect feedback from the industry. 
okay. Okay. one or two businesses talking about them themselves is not a, an industry representation. The second is we have a position to start, okay, which is a lot better than coming in and saying, we don't know what people do. It's different for every business that goes across it. There are no standards. So it's very powerful to be able to go to the FDA and have a starting point. Mm -hmm. And now we put that starting point around th all things that we in this organization believe are reasonable and fair. So then I guess at least the FDA knows that it's not the Wild West out there, right? Uh, correct, and that's the, the part of it. And they will, lack of information hurts you just as, uh, as much as doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Now, um, I, I just received, a, I'm, I'm, and, and I apologize, these things are popping up on me like ants <laughs> at a picnic. I'm getting messages from like four different instant messaging systems, and they're all for you. Uh, I got a message from a vendor who asked to remain anonymous. Uh, and uh, what the comment was is this person thinks it's a great <laughs> idea that you this person thinks that uh, I have two Skype connections going funny, and uh, they look like they're back. Okay, we had a little internet choke there. It looks like you guys are back. Can you hear me now, Link? I can hear you. It tells me that there's okay, a little bit good. of a slow connection, but I can hear you. Yeah, yeah the internet just burped. Um <laughs> Uh, the, the vendor uh, a vendor sent in a question that they, and they want to remain anonymous. I'm going to honor that, um, and it's a it's a good question. They say it's a great idea that's been a long time coming. Uh, they're concerned about the majority of the board being vendors, which they say would be a major issue, and then they followed up with the idea of the interview process can't be with a vendor. It the the that information within the organization has has to be sequestered from the other vendor members. Do you, so the do you results of the of the application and their application process absolutely needs to be sequestered from uh, the general membership. Um, as far as the people doing the interviews uh, being members, that's why we have a mutual non-disclosure disclosure agreement uh, that, that takes place so that their intellectual property can be saved and there are uh, liability and uh, uh, legal repercussions for violating that. Um, but to say that uh, they shouldn't be interviewed by the uh, individuals who understand how these businesses run, I don't necessarily uh, agree with. The people best suited to be able to talk about the, uh, the process and the challenges that an applicant faces are the people who have actually done this and gone through it. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I, I I see the I see the concerns on both sides. I I, I I think if people see the organization performing, they're not going to have quite the issue with the question that this person is posing. Um, I I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm very middle of the road on this. I think it could be a good thing. Um, and uh, one of the things that informs me on this is the fact that I I, I actually know some of you guys. Um, so I mean I'm hopeful that it 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 delivers. Um, and it, I I guess that's what I uh, that's I guess that's pretty much what I have to say about the issue. And I don't have any more questions on my screen. Um, we're coming up to t uh, 12:06 a.m. So we should probably get to the point where we can wrap this up. If there are final questions, can people please? get them in in the next two minutes i'm going to let the other two guys wrap up clear the questions and so you know link I, I really appreciate you coming on and answering some of these questions and uh you know i i, I know that i have you know uh i had some tough questions that uh you know i i posed and i do hope uh and, and i believe that regulation is necessary um i do hope that this works out, that we get better quality juice because of it, um, and that we can buy in confidence because of it. Um, I do think that there's still some, some questions that will be answered in the future. And I think uh, while I would rather see them answered now, uh, that's just maybe not the nature of things. 
but I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, and tackling all of the questions from, from us and from uh, the audience. Uh, it's just really nice of you. Well, I appreciate you coming on. And oh, go ahead, go ahead Link. It's all yours. I was going to say, I appreciate coming on. And I actually appreciate the hard questions because um, this is not, you know, something that, that, that we take lightly. And we're uh, attempting to be as absolutely as transparent as we can uh, about how the organization uh, runs, what our goals are, um, and essentially what we represent. Um, so I invite and, you know, I, I, I know in forums that there's going to be, you know, harsh criticism, things like that. And I fully expected it because uh, they, they, the fact is that it is kind of uh, controversial uh, for some folks. And the one thing that I love about this community is that it is very passionate and very opinionated. Yeah. Um, I think it helps build uh, the community. The community. Absolutely. Yeah. Basil? I just, I just want to interject. I don't, kind of, I don't have anything to add. Hang on, JK is queuing up here. Go, JK. Hey. Um, I, I just want to interject as somebody that was unfortunately involved in the first attempt at this by the NDC. People are comparing this to what the NDC tried to do, and those comparisons couldn't be more inaccurate. Um, I, I know what was done, I know how it was done. And everything about how the original attempt was made was wrong. Um, and I'm not talking about lion terms now, with your attempt at this. I'm talking about more with broad strokes. You're handling this much more professionally than has been done in the past. <clears throat> you are also the only group that is for the parts of vaping, I guess, that we all need juice things other than just pre-filled titles and mall kiosks. And the people right now that have the potential to give cable don't do online sales, all have, you know, brick and mortar stores, they don't sell juice, it's all pre-filled titles. And that's the only thing they're going to care about doing if they get a seat at the table. I think generally speaking, from my experience in the last three years, people understand regulations coming and I, and I think, you know, obviously they're scared that the FDA is the one they're doing it, but they, their biggest fear is losing juice, you know, having to deal with companies like Blue, and I'm not putting them down, but this is a company that has a specific business plan. If they are the only ones at the table, if anyone is invited, then we're kind of left hanging in the wind. So we have needed for a long time a group from the community made up of vendors and others, and non-vendors, that if people get invited, get invited as well, can at least counteract some of the, but we only care about pre cutters and small kiosks, you know, brick and mortar so We don't want them on sales. We need to have a presence there that says, well, wait a minute. You know, there are millions of vapors out there that do this, and here's why, and this is the reality of it. And it's a very, very important thing to do. And, and I'm not saying you're doing it perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I think the fact that you have made it abundantly clear both in writing and tonight that this is an extremely fluid situation at this point is one of the best things you can do. Um, telling people, assuring us that you're going to have you know, complete and total transparency is an exceptionally good thing to do. I think, in broad strokes, you're doing this the best way that it can be done, in my experience. You have a long way to go. There's going to be all kinds of people that bitch about the line items, but from a broad stroke, you guys are doing the right thing, in my opinion. Thank you, J.K. Thanks, J.K. That's that's a good good input. And he's a um, tough customer, too. He's not an easy man to please. He's, he was in the middle of some stuff in and the past, was. and uh, I, I, I have mad respect for the guy, but that's me. Um, uh, well, can, can we get to a point here where we can bring this to a close, guys? Uh, I want to. We're we're coming up on twelve twelve here. Um, we can probably go uh, fielding questions until two in the morning, and yeah, I think so. Just we, a one quick small question, Mike. Okay. Are you going to be at uh, VaporCon? Uh, oh. Yes, I am. Oh. Okay, we've got to sit down and have a beer and talk. 
because I'd love good to, 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 to learn more about you. And I, I really appreciate all your guys' time. All right, Link, thank you very much for coming Thanks. on the show. And uh, remember, uh, there is, uh, I think, you're going to have multiple members on Vape Team. Is it a bigger production that you're doing there? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I believe or? we're going to have uh, we're going to have uh, Lou Ritter, the president of the organization, uh, as well as uh, Adam from Vaporcast and okay. Anthony and myself. Okay, fantastic. So you can get more answers there. We've given you as many as we can tonight. Link, thank you. Um, this is the longest show that I've ever done outside of the box elder thing. <laughs> and we could have done three bio breaks because I'm floating. So we're going <laughs> we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap this up. Link, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, I hope we can uh, arrange a, a show down the line when uh, we've got more to say. Excellent. And uh, I'll be at VaporCon, so I'd love to talk to people about it. Yep, great. We'll see I you there, bro. I look forward to finally getting to meet you in person. I look forward to that. So do I. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Have a great night, guys. You too. We'll see hey, you thanks, then. Link. Goodbye. Thanks, Link. All right, all. So, for the Vape thanks, Link crew. Thanks. Don't forget to thank JK. I'm don't going to. to. Thank that guy. I'm right. going to. I'm going to thank all him. Right. Just make and sure. Scott. And Scott for calling. And him. Scott. And Scott. Absolutely. And we'll take more calls. And I, I, we've been doing this so long, I want to beat my head with a, with a, a, a gym shoe. Um <laughs> So for the Vapling team, I'm Kaz. Thank you uh, for, uh, you know, coming to the show. And uh, thanks to Link for coming on and taking the hard questions. And we'll follow up on this as it develops. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Do your thing, bro. Hey, everybody who stuck with us. I know it was a long show. I uh, appreciate it. And we will see you guys next week. Hey, uh, don't forget to tell all your friends to swing by next week and subsequent weeks. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys, uh, hopefully many, many of you, this weekend at VaporCon. Big thanks to all our guests uh, tonight. Of course, we had Lou, Scott, JK, and Link from We Are Vapors slash uh, our favorite new regulatory board. And um, hey, take care out there. All right, and thanks to VapeNet. Uh, did, they, did they get the whole thing? Are they still going? Thank you to yep, them, even if they didn't. Strong. Thanks so much. We love them. Uh, we're out of here. See you guys later. This is going to be a review of the Smoke Tech Telescope. I felt compelled to make a video now. I believe that there are safety issues with this. Let's get into the safety issues first. Bent through the threads here. I doubted that. That is airtight. Airtight. Nothing is venting. Final. End of story. I did it with a balloon.